Hello, this is Joel Whitney with the Syracuse University College of Law, and I'd like to welcome you to this edition of the New York State Science and Technology Law Center webcast. Today's webcast is hosted by Shuba Ghosh, the Crandall Melvin Professor of Law and Director of the Technology Commercialization Law Program. Shuba? Yeah, thank you, Joel, and uh, Happy New Year to everybody. We are launching uh, this year's webinar series, and I'm really excited because we've got a very, uh, very interesting and provocative opening uh, salvo in our continuing discussion about intellectual property and technology commercialization. Uh, I have with us today, uh, well, live from Chicago, <laughs> uh, Valdavia Ellis and Stacy Ellis, who are co-CEOs and co-founders of House of Maid. And we're going to have a discussion about a topic that's uh, you know fairly cutting edge and fairly interesting and probably deserves more attention than it's gotten, and that's uh, custom fitting design. And we're going to talk about the patent and commercialization issues associated with it. And um, in a few minutes, I'll have uh, the Ellis's discuss what their business model is. But just to give you some of the the branding, here's the House of Made, which is the the logo and a picture from their website. And here is some of their advertising regarding the kind of clothing and fashion that they that they design. Uh, I like uh, I like the logos here. Beautiful liberation. It's like putting on confidence. You can't. I don't think you can say it better than that. And so uh, let's open up our our discussion. I think uh, to give sort of an agenda for the next hour, there are three big topics. Starting with uh, you know providing some background on what how House of Made came into existence and its background and what it does, and then we'll talk about some of the interesting intellectual property issues and strategies that uh, that the company has been pursuing, and then we'll we'll end by talking about some of the ongoing commercialization strategy issues. So uh, enough said on my part. Uh, let me turn it over to you to give us some sense of uh, how you would define your business and explain your business to, uh, to, the, uh, to the public. Um, thank you, Joel and um, Sheila, for inviting us to this uh, webinar. Um, I may be a little nervous. This is my first time, so excuse me. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, Hello, everyone. Yes, you say So um, our business um, background is um, Stacy and I met at Howard University, and I was a fashion student there, and I had transferred from architecture, and I had met Stacy in architecture also before he took a turn into fashion. Um, and we um, went into fashion separately at the time, and by the time I graduated, we met back up and uh, decided that we would do clothing for... Um, what we would call the body type of African descent. And in 2004, um, we were, in 2005, we were awarded um, our first patent on the body type of African descent. Um, in 2005, um, we thought that we were able to um, be able to, you know, promote the business start and to scale it. start to scale it. And what Stacey and I tend to do is pray about how we should take our, mm -hmm. what steps we should take. And mm -hmm. we, in our prayer, we're told that now we need to create um, a sizing system for other body types. Mm -hmm. And those other body types included Caucasian, um, mixed body type of African descent, um, just, just to expand the um, array of body types that we make clothing for. Um, in the beginning, when we started this process, we had no idea that we would end up doing a patent um, with the first one. We just thought that, you know, this is something that we were supposed to do. We wanted to make an impact in the fashion industry. We didn't want to be like, um, you know, just an aesthetic designer. We wanted to, to actually um, have some meaning behind what we did. And uh, the more we did research to try and find out uh, the missing pieces to what we needed to create this sizing system, we ended up having to um, talk to many attorneys and them advising us that we may want to do a patent. Um, and we had no idea what that entailed at the time. And um, we ended up doing the research and finding out that we did have to do a patent and that there was nothing that um, was published or that we could find uh, that would help us create the standard. So we we had to do it. We had to we had to create 
the standard with um, gathering data and information and interviewing people and um, testing our system that we created. We had to do it all ourselves. So after um, we did the patent in 2005, we were awarded that patent. Um, it was a fight because the patent office did not believe that there was a difference between the different body types. And even though we can see that there are different there are differences in shapes um, with different groups of people, it was not sufficient for them initially that we would say it um, and we had to go back and forth with the patent office um, supplying different proofs that um, what, we, what we were trying to convince them of was legitimate. Um, and so actually it happened in 2005, they finally gave it to us. And then in 2005, in 2005 again, uh, we did decide to do the other body types. And I think, when did they award this last patent? The design patent or the utility patent? The, the, the design yeah. patent was awarded um, in 2012, and the new one was just recently uh, granted uh, in 2017. So, um, and those those include the newer, the other yeah. body types um, that we added in. Um, and so now we're at the point where we are trying to figure out how to scale and how to start. And most of our time of um, this business has been mostly research and development and um, trying to figure out how to scale it, what, where to start, what products to start with, because we initially started with denim. And our clients in testing some of these things were asking for other things, other items. So we don't know where we're going to start really, but um, we're just listening to our clients and trying to make sure that we provide them with um, the things that they need and work on, I guess, um, scale. Yeah, commercialization plan. Yeah. yeah, so that's great. I mean, I, I wanted to show, we'll talk about these patents, uh, some of the patents that we that you mentioned uh, in some more detail. I did want to show people who are watching uh, you know, what, what we are being referred to, but we'll get to that in, in, in more detail in a minute. Uh, I, guess, I guess a couple of questions that people might have, uh, I'll just ask both of them now. One is, um, what led you to identify this need, um, and, and what is it about the marketplace that wasn't meeting, meeting this need before you got there? Yes. And uh, you know, maybe, maybe the, the next question is probably the one that makes maybe more sense to answer first. Uh, you both design and manufacturing the, manufacture the, uh, the fashion, the clothing, is that correct? Correct, yes. Both how do you manufacture it? It's a traditional manufacturing, or do you outsource that? Or We initially, we tried to outsource it several times. Yes. Um, and we had some bad experiences with um, loss, and then we've had some good experiences, but still ended up being a loss because those companies were bought out by larger companies. Yeah. Um, and so we, we know that we're, um, just us, to try to scale this um, is you know, sort of like an uphill battle. But we decided that since we kept having this bad luck with trying to outsource it and do it the, the way that, you know, a school would teach teach you, um, instruct you, if it's only two of you to do this production, then, you you know, go out and outsource it. But we, we continue to have bad um, experiences. So we decided to, to do it ourselves. And were, were you most, working in the U.S. with companies? Is that the outsourcing in the U.S.? Or? I've only done it in the U.S., we yes. had well, we had samples uh, a few years back uh, made in Italy. We went to Italy yeah. for a few months right. twice. Yes, we did. And um, one of the things that we realized is that our patterns, uh, because of the the body types that we service, uh, of course, our patterns are going to be different. And we have eight right. body types. So now you're looking at, say, for instance, uh, a woman size four skinny jean. Um, that skinny jean in the same fabric, you're going to have eight different patterns for that one style. Now, when you're asking a manufacturer to make that for you, um, traditionally, that's not how it happens. They, they look at it in each different styles. So you have to have a tech pack for each one. Um, and so for them, that's a little overwhelming, and it's, and it's a confusing way to look at it um, in their mindset. You know? And even when it comes to uh, assembling our garment, um, our shapes are different. So even on the, the, the assembly line itself, the workers have to be trained, and they have to you know, look at it from a, with a fresh eye. 
and yeah. to basically revamp that manufacturing line. Uh, a lot of many, a lot of the companies that we outsourced to had had a dedicated line just for our stuff, but they also um, uh, raised the price a little bit too. So, mm -hmm. and, but it wasn't advantageous for them, you know, for, yeah. for what they were saying. And so, for us, um, we we look forward to becoming a, a, a manufacturer because we have to. Mm -hmm. um, it's not that we haven't we don't have interest in seeking you know partnerships or, or you know uh, or client you know from contractors. It's just that because we um, understand the assembly of our manufacturing process and we know what the end product should be, we ha yeah. now have to create our own SOP for manufacturing to understand how to scale it. You know, SOP standard operating procedure. Is that yes, right? Sir. Yes, sir. Okay, and that, that's really interesting. And I think what do you, you have a plant in Los Angeles and in Chicago. Is that right? Plants in both, or well, we yeah, that right? we we had small uh, uh, design offices in LA. And we had one in Chicago, but we closed both those down because we we need to have an actual full fledged larger factory, and so that's what we're actually working on now. We're looking to um, two options: we're either going to go uh, overseas um, in the Caribbean to manufacture, um, or we're going to do a domestic side here in the U.S., um, particularly in the South. We're looking at a facility right now in Georgia. You know. Okay. I mean, so. That's that's what we're all the details, but yeah, no, that's good to know that uh, that's that's the next stage. And I would imagine is when you mentioned the standard operating procedures, you had to develop new standards and maybe even new machines as well. Is that am I understanding that correctly? Yes, there's going to be some new developments when it comes to assembling this. Yes, so and and, and so you're also you know you're both really well trained and designed and. Uh, and and I, what I mean by design is actually figuring out what the clothing line should look like. Uh, yes. Do you want to explain a little bit about that process? So how do you design, for example, uh, let, let's go back to your advertising, jeans like this. I assume you do both tops and, and, and pants, or both tops and jeans and other lines, items of clothing, right? Um, yeah. Yes. And so forth, yeah. Yes. So the question is, how do we design? Yeah, design? What's, we... what's that creative price, process like, and, and what's the, you know, when you're sitting at the desk, or if you do a computer assisted, you want to give us a sense of what what that thought process is. Yes, yes. It's, it's I was trying to figure out the direction that you were going in because I can answer this question so many ways. Yeah. Like like any other artistic person, um, I need to bring. I need, my husband needs to put the reins on me because my brain is going at a thousand miles an hour on all the creativity that can happen. Yes. Um and. This is what we have is me, right? Not, 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 you know, going so wide. Um, so what I do normally is for, you know, things that I would like to wear, things that I would, things that I would like to wear is number one. Yeah. And, and then things that I can manufacture and sew myself to produce for my clients. Yeah. Um, that limits me on what I can do, but it makes me more efficient for what I can supply. Okay. So those are two major things that I consider when I design. Right. Um, and then um, since we are designing for curves, um, we also make sure that we consider fabric is very important. Textile is important because we only use, use stretch, stretch denim when we're doing jeans. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it's for comfort, but it really needs to be functioning. And uh, in a lot of denim um, companies in the industry um, use stretch denim, you know, that has a slight break. It's, it's slightly comfortable, um, but we, we tend to use a lot more stretch and um, it's a fitted jean. And yeah. so that women can actually function in it. So functionality is also important. Yeah, no, I think that's the right. I'm sorry, Stacey, did you have a? Well, just on the fabric aspect, uh, what, we've, what we've learned uh, is that the fabric itself needs to, needs to mimic uh, sort of the movement of the skin. And, uh, and you have to take in, you know, muscle girth and, you know, movement and how those muscles move. So yeah. there's a lot of thought process that goes into the fabric as it relates to the body itself. Right. You know, how the shape and the line, the contour are going to move um, smoothly and transition, you know, well with the body. Yeah, do you use models for that? Is that done? Is, is a lot of that done computer assisted? It's just sort of common sense or? My number one model's right here. <laughs> <laughs> so I test out the product. <laughs> then you figure yes. out from there 
how to generalize to different types of different body yes. types. Yes, yes, yeah. I, I test out the patterns. Um, and then I also use um, clients. And then we do have models that give us feedback from everything that we do. Yes. And that's a point we'll get to in a minute when we talk about the patents, um, because obviously there, I don't know how many, you know, how many different body types there are. We could make the, I guess some people might think that every individual has their own body type, right? So uh, this raises some interesting questions about the patenting and the marketing and so forth. Yeah. But, uh, but uh, that, that's very helpful. I think, I think um, you know, Valdavia's answer and responses uh, really got to where I was thinking of going with the question, and that is, uh, your business model is really based upon a perceived need, right? Mm -hmm. So it's yes. not like you're trying to say everybody should be wearing this uh, next season. It's they should be wearing this because there's a need in the marketplace for it. So, mm -hmm. so this gets back to the first question. That is, how did how did you first perceive that need, and how would you describe that need? I mean, you talked a little bit about that, but when you first started the business and, and thought about this uh, this uh, this niche in the marketplace. Uh, how did you, you know, what experiences, what uh, background led to you identifying that need? Um, well, for me, because we got these epiphanies at two different points in yeah. life. <laughs> so for me, um, I, to tell you the truth, um, I, shoot, I just wanted to be a designer that made some impact. Yeah. And, and so I actually... I actually prayed about what it was that, you know, I was, what was my purpose or what was I supposed to do? And so after praying, um, I heard that I was supposed to make clothing products for the body of African descent. And when I heard it, I was like, okay, um, that is different. And I am of African descent mm -hmm. and I definitely have a typical, um, body, smaller waist, fuller thighs, for um, gluteus, and I have issues fitting clothing. And so it made sense to me to solve a problem that I could relate to and mm -hmm. that I could, I, I knew um, I had a point of reference. Right. And so that is how I got started with this. And so I began to pursue that, um, that, that from that point of view? Um, well, mine is a little different. I, I was still a student at Howard University. And at the time, um, I was trying to figure out what to do and where I wanted to go because I was a student in art, school architecture. Um, I initially wanted to design something that was impactful and changing um, to the point where building a city where it was well run, sort of like a smart city. Uh -huh. um, but at the time, yeah, and I was doing some modeling too. And so what I realized is that there were some, I don't, I don't want to call it necessarily biases, but there were some per perceptions within the fashion industry uh, when I was doing shows and things like that. Uh, I realized that when I was putting on a garment and some of the models that I was with were some of the same size and height as me, but the clothing had a little bit more, more adjustment issues uh, on me than it did on, you know, my counterpart who happened to be Caucasian. Right. And I found that to be consistent. And I ended up helping a friend of a friend um, do some sketches in New York. Um, she was starting a fashion line. She was a student at, 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 uh, at one of the schools in New York. And um, I thought what she had was interesting. And so I did the sketches. And then, you know, over the course of a couple of weeks, she ended up getting financed. And so what I noticed was that there's a process that need to be undertaken for looking at fashion that needed seemingly, in my, in my opinion, needed to include everyone. Um, because for me, working in the industry, the clothing itself was beautiful. The fabrication was excellent and the, 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 the execution of the design was there. But for whatever reason, like my wife said, it didn't seem like it included me. You know, it was always extra because they don't sell clips, you know, you know, you know, you see large paper clips and things of that nature when you buy clothing. But why was I wearing that when I was walking down the runway or in a photo shoot? And so what I realized is that there was no um, research uh, or evidence that there was an inclusive design model for people that look like me 
or anyone that was uh, not European, you know, in their ethnicity or, 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 you know, descent. So that's how I started. And then when I came back to Howard University, you know, I talked with Val, and she agreed, and to my surprise and to my happiness at the same time, that she had switched her major from architecture to fashion. And so for me, that was all like a godsend, and that's what I prayed for, and I wanted us to work together, and um, and that's what we did. And I could, so um, while, before I actually went to New York, we backtrack one second, I met with a, a good friend of mine, Al Freeman. He was um, a professor at Howard University, and um, he just, you know, was talking to me. He's like, you know, look at you in deep contemplative thought. What, do you, what are you thinking about? And so I, I mentioned to him about this idea. And then he took me to, you know, his friend who was the dean of the School of Business and the president of the university. And so we had this, this, this group think meeting, right? And their conclusion was that I should go elsewhere to find this, this truth and to research it because I couldn't find it at Howard, Howard University. Mm-hmm. And I was, to say the, the least, I was very surprised at that advice. But it was the best advice that I got. You know, right. So, and that's um, good. So you're one of the schools for p- people who left school to develop your entrepreneurship spirit, and now are, is you know potentially giving back to the school. So that's great, right? Yes, yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. So you know, I think it's, it was probably helpful for our listeners. We've ta- we've had um, a separate conversation about this. That you know, a lot of this was happening in the '90s, right? If I get the timeline right, and then yes. I think starting in the '40s, what there was the PS4270 standard. Uh, that's for clothing, and so this is largely for off the rack. And I guess even in the '90s, we still didn't have uh, the, the bespoke, you know, the individualized uh, clothing model that maybe we're getting to, and we'll talk a little bit more about in a few minutes. But do you want to talk a little bit about the PS4270 standard before you start moving into your IP work? Um, well, the the product, well, the PS4270 uh, was yeah. created by the Department of Commerce, um, yeah, back in the '40s. Uh, what it was was a voluntary product standard um, that worked with the manufacturers and retailers at that time um, in America, and I think there were a few internationally, to create an industry. So the, the, right. the, the industry had to be created. So it was taking manufacturers and retailers, and they had to have a common goal. And so in order to have a common goal, they had to have a common consumer group, and they had to have a common industrial standard. Mm-hmm. So that's how we have what we have today. But if we, you know, can be some quick studies of history, in the 40s, um, if you were not of, let's say, American Caucasian um, nationality, um, the, there was a non-inclusive uh, discussion and implementation of policy to exclude others from their primary industrial or economic endeavors. Um, right. When you when we started in the '90s, that problem, you know, and we and it is a problem, uh, still existed. Um, that standard in this newest iteration is still being sold on the Department of Commerce's and this partner uh, agency's websites to this day. Right. Um, when you have in this world of 2018 um, the advancement of what we call the fourth industrial revolution, right? Many people groups around the world from the 40s, and even up until now, were not included in the Industrial Revolution in the actual beneficiary category, right? They didn't benefit um, as other people did. And so, not to rehash history, but what we have to do is really take a look at where we are and take a look at what the PS4270 and other standards like that, what they have created, right? Yeah. And we don't, we're not talking about just products. We're talking about making products for certain individuals. Well, the product itself doesn't really have a mind to say that I, I want to be worn on a certain people group, right? So that takes, the des- it's up to the designer. And, you know, um, most of the design ideology, uh, what, what they allow is for you to design for your intended consumer. You can pick your consumer. And my and in the fourth industrial revolution, with all this technology floating around, and with people in India and, and, and the continent of Africa and in Asia uh, able to go into a smartphone and look at you know any app or any website and look at a product and say, "Hey, I want to buy that." All the business um, models are in place, and all the resources are in place to get that product from the warehouse or the the store in say New York to someone in Moldova, right? There's nothing preventing that. But what is preventing there from being a 
an experience from a, a consumer happiness standpoint is that we don't have an academic policy, we don't have an industrial policy, and we don't have a human policy of looking at each other equally in our industrial, economic, and our academic endeavors. We have to create a paradigm shift, and that paradigm shift includes all of us in this model. We're in 2018. We can't have a 40, uh, 1940s mindset in the world that we live in. Yeah, I think what that points to, what the, both of you have set out, is that what you're doing is really part of a, a global phenomenon. Uh, you mentioned other countries, India, South Africa. I'm looking at the study uh, from the African Development Bank on the you know, fashion industry that's emerging in, uh, in various parts of uh, continental Africa. And so uh, I think that's kind of very important to, to point out as we're thinking about the background to your business. And it's something that's coming up in Europe. You think about the 1940s, you know, regardless of what the, the ethnic or racial background is, you know, people are bigger now than they were in the 1940s. Yeah, yeah. You know, a lot of people have different body types than they did in the typical uh, uh, prototype uh, for the 1940s standard. So this is a really important issue in terms of how we think about new standards and how the fashion industry uh, responds. Yeah, th there's a lot of study research out there. Uh, most recently, there's one by a company called Body Labs, which was recently purchased by Amazon. Um, they do I have that in front of me. I was looking at that. We can send links to people who are interested, but yeah, please. Yeah, they, they, they did a very good uh, you know, study on the uh, economic value of yeah. proper fit um, and having fit. And it's in the billions of dollars. Um, and we need to do something about that. It's just not here in America. It's in Europe. It, 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 it exists everywhere where there's clothing and consumers. Right. Right. I mean, I think they start off by saying, you know, uh, I don't know if the readers, uh, viewers can see this, but a read at $62.4 billion, I think, uh, based on 2016 numbers, or I'm not sure what the base is at, but still, whatever the, the timeline is. $62.4 billion, they say, a worth of apparel and footwear returned due to the incorrect fit, right? whether that's on online or some other, some other source of... Uh, and there's some really interesting studies here or d details here about just the, the general satisfaction level with the clothing lines that are available you know, off the rack or uh, through other means. And you know, one of the things, uh, it's probably worth mentioning it here, it'll come up, uh, I think, at a number of points, is... You know, one response to all of this might be that why, why can't everything just be bespoke? You know, why can't everybody just get their own individualized tailor and, uh, you know, to whatever the equivalent of Savile Row is? And we'll talk a little bit about whether the industry is going there. Obviously, that's, that's very idealistic. Not, not everybody can afford, afford their individual tailor to do that. Right. And so we're going to be stuck with off the rack or some, you know, some model that's like that. And I think what you're working on is how to adjust that model to a world that doesn't fit old standards. Yeah, I mean, we're working on a mass customization model. Um, right. There are companies out there that's trying to, you know, solve that from a you know, manufacturing environment. Amazon, you know, recently right. had a patent dealing with, you know, custom ordering, you know, uh, more of the bespoke of what you're speaking of. Um, yeah, yeah. The delivering that is, is another thing. They have, you know, right. all the, the networks in, in, in recent and logistics in place, you know, right. to be able to, to warehouse and to customize that type of uh, uh, delivery model. Um, but is that changing what they're delivering, though? Correct. Yeah. You know, will, will Amazon be able to deliver a pair of jeans for me that fit correctly based upon what they are using from their the input of their product, which is the patterns? See, everything comes down to design, comes down right. to the patterns. And if that's you know, something that we really focus on. We really focus on the person um, and looking at the the group and subgroups of each ethnicity, nationality, and the racial groups around the world. Yeah, and so let me, I did, let's just finish up a little bit about the background of the business because I didn't ask this, but it's probably interesting to know. Your distribution model has largely been internet-based, or do you work with retailers like uh, like Walmart or with... Uh, no, I mean, we, we, we tried to reach out, and we, we've been in many discussions and meetings over the years uh, with companies that uh, that have brands and have their own chain of stores, but they're, they didn't know how to retail. They, yeah. There's an education level that needs to happen uh, at the company level as well as educating the, 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 their consumers as well. Right. So that's where people 
were having some problems. And plus, they were looking at the numbers that you mentioned about the returns and things of that nature. And there really is a, a problem discussing the consumer, especially the consumer that is not your typical, you know, large population, like in America, is Caucasian. So people tend to go with the majority group mentality. But... And you mean people have, marketing. I mean, the marketing decisions. Yes. And the business decisions. Well, see, yeah, right. when you open your doors, just like America, when you, in any country, if you open your doors, you allow people to come in, you take the responsibility of making sure that every person that walks in the door can be serviced properly. And part of the service is knowing what the intender user is going to be or who they're going to be. And if you anticipate, you know, say for Brooklyn, Brooklyn is a very large, you know, part of the economy of this, you know, the city of New York and the state. But Brooklyn has a eclectic mix of people from all over the world. And you mean to tell me that if you have a store that has a population, say, of, you know, one million people of African ancestry and uh, two million of Caucasian, you're only going to make products that benefit the actual majority population? And see, yeah. that's where we are. That's what retail, that's what design, that's what industry. That's what they know. That's what they're taught. So th there's an education uh, level that needs to happen. And our business model is based upon, first and foremost, knowing and researching and designing in a different way, you know, in an all-inclusive design model. And when you have that, then you, you invite people to your product. And we, we have a lot of uh, great feedback. You know, we, we're probably at... I won't say zero, but we have a very, very low return rate of our products. And so, and that's a good indication that, you know, we're heading in the right direction. Yeah. No, I, mean, I think that's a great point to end on, on, on this segment of our discussion because the bricks and mortar world, we tend to forget it. It's standardized. And, you know, the, the beauty of the internet, uh, you know, as you described it, the fourth industrial revolution is to kind of rethink these standards and, and maybe even move to one that's more flexible or even some, in some sense, standardless, right? It's, it's more individualized, more tailored. And yes. Forth. But uh, again, this is worth setting up here because we'll talk about it in more detail. Uh, it can't be completely individualized. I mean, that's sort of the, the, the difficulty and uh, to reach that point. Uh, but we'll, we'll talk about that. And in some ways, you don't want it to be completely individualized. And yeah. that creates problems of its own in terms of how the marketplace operates. So. So that's great. I mean, with that with that background in mind, let's talk a little bit about some of your intellectual property uh, strategy, some of your woes, and some of your victories, so to speak. Uh, I know you had you had some copyrights uh, in in some of your early designs. Is that correct? Or yes. Yeah. So which, what did you copyright, or what did, do you remember what you had copyrights in? Or uh, the first one um, granted a copyright in 1999. Um, it was a gene pattern. Um, Registered. Yeah, yeah. We, we were developing uh, at that time a gene because we were advised that uh, the the way to brand it and the most common product for branding in the apparel, you know, industry would be denim. And so, um, our first copyright uh, was for uh, the the African body type, and um, that copyright allowed us to you know move forward and being able to understand in, in the U.S. Uh, that, you know, there's a large market, but we also needed to learn about IP and the strategy of IP. So copyright for fashion is not something that allows you, uh, that is under copyright law here in the United States. Um, you have to go to Europe and some other countries uh, to get protection under copyright for fashion. In particular, right. France um, is a leader in that particular field when it comes to enforcement and protection under the law, under copyright as well. Um, that's just it's something, it's, it's, you know, yeah. that, that's why you see fashion, for the most part, coming out of Italy, coming out of Germany, coming out of Spain, and mainly the European countries, with the leaders being France, Italy, and the UK, yeah. um, mainly because of IP law, right? And you have a uh, national strategy uh, to create, I mean, to protect those designs and treat them as assets, national assets at that. And to contrast that with the U.S., you can now protect fashion under design patent law, under what they call the Hague System 
or the Hague uh, registration for the international protection of registered designs. Um, the U.S. joined a few years ago, um, mm -hmm. and a lot of a lot of asset value can be created by protecting those uh, those uh, assets of fashion. And we, because we we're solving a fit problem, we are in a position where we have to understand and know IP uh, protection laws uh, where, wherever we're trying to solve the problem. And since we're trying to solve a global problem, um, we're getting well-versed in global IP strategy and laws as, there, as they exist around the world. Yeah, and so one, one, of, the, one of the early hiccups that you had um, all involved trademark too, right? I think some of our listeners may have noticed the yes. similarity between your surname and that of another <laughs> fashion designer. Did you want to talk yeah, a little bit you know, about well, that? Well, you know, uh, names are important. I, I, I will say that first. And um, how we acquire names is, you know, another discussion. But, yes, we, we uh, had uh, a trial in, 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 in the test with uh, uh, Perios International. Um, yeah. When we first started, our, the name of our company was Ellis Black. Um, of course, our last name is Ellis. And we were designing for what we were solving for was a solution for the black body type. So we put it together and called Ellis Black. Okay. But uh, Perios International thought we were, you know, infringed upon their trademark. And so for like almost four years, we went back and forth with Perios International about the name. Um, I think they were challenging your attempt to register per Ellis Black. I think it was, that, yes. it was an op something called an opposition. Yeah. Yes, they, they, they were challenging that. Um, so what I, what, I, what I proposed to them was to let's do a historical, you know, genetic or maybe a historical analysis of the name, maybe... Because, you know, since the advent of slavery here in the United States and in the Americas, maybe there's a possibility we could be related, and maybe this is a family issue. And so, uh, you know, they kind of backed off of that idea. But we ended up in the uh, uh, trademark court. and uh, yeah. Yeah, and so it was very interesting how that went. You know, the, the decision took a lot longer than we all anticipated. You know, they normally yeah. decide yeah. within a few weeks, you know, 10 days, something like that. It took a few months. And so, um, you know, one judge decided for us, one for Perry Ellis International, and one was neutral. So, again, the law of the land, majority rule, and they decided to go with Perry Ellis International since they've been in business longer, had, had trademark um, that was put into the marketplace, and they had a value attached to the name. And so we ended up having to uh, change the name, which worked out to our favor. Is that where House of Made then came in, or did you have some other names before? Well, the, ho the House of Made itself is a design re and research and development company. Okay. And uh, the name of the brand itself that we're now using is Beautiful Liberation. Okay, there it is. Okay. So, Have you registered that? or? Yes, that's, that's a registered trademark, Beautiful Liberation. All right. Okay, that's great. So those are the trademark and some of the copyright issues. And let's I talk a little bit about the patent. I'm sorry, go ahead. I just want to add one thing. Um, this that trademark case was um, very disturbing to me because it just seemed really weird that this large company would come after little us. Uh -huh. <laughs> and um, you know, while we were and we kept trying to recruit or get um, uh, legal representation, and they kept telling us, "Oh, you're going to lose this." We'll just take your money and you'll, it'll be a waste of money. Just, you know, give up mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and just change the name. And while in the end, you know, if we had to pay someone, it would have been a waste of money um, from their point of view. Um, right. But we did our own legal answering and responding for four year, for three, four years. Yes. We did. We did the legal, um, all of the legal um, work ourselves. And um, what we found in our research is that the, that the um, trademark um, board had allowed, um, there were trademarks that were, um, for instance, like Charles Ellis or um, yes. Perry. Um, um, Perry Adam Edel, Ellis or something like that. Right. Yeah. So yeah. there were trademarks granted with either the surname or the first name for yeah. other people. And in our um, in our case, they were you know arguing that 
it was it would be a confusion. And we were wondering why was this list already granted of trademarks with these yeah. names on it, which is really weird, right? Um, and that you know was that was very upsetting. And of course, some other things took place, which you could probably research and figure out. There's a guy named John Welch. John Welch, yes. John He's Welch in Boston. in Boston, who was a trademark, who wrote a blog about these types of cases. Mm-hmm. And we should have had that information up. I mean, you can go and check it out. But he, yeah. um, he, he made some comments about that case and how it didn't make any sense and how it was kind of weird and very suspicious. Um, yeah. But um, that's something that, you know, people can go on record and probably Google that information um, in his, uh, his comments about that because he's someone who is um, noteworthy when it comes to talking about these types of cases and trademark um, right. court. Right. Yeah, but that, you know, basically, even if it all ended up sort of okay, that was three years out of your life, basically, or three years out yeah, of your they were, business. Yeah, they're they're pretty uh, uh, taxing to say the least. You know, uh, we're not attorneys, uh, but we had to learn a lot about law, about how to uh, look at um, how to respond and things of that nature. And um, it just got to a point where it it, it just looked like this was not about. Uh, the trademark, uh, just to, you know, keep it within the confines of, of, of the public information, you know. Right. It didn't seem to us, and then it, it, it was verified later on that it was it had a lot more to do with what we were doing versus the name of it and what we were doing, yeah. you know. Yeah. And um, it, it opened up our eyes, you know, we learned the value of our company uh, at the time and what we were doing uh, with the product which led to us filing the patents and learning about international uh, patent law and trademark law. So as much as it, it was it was troubling for myself and my wife, it actually helped us and propelled us into uh, the world of IP in a more diligent, you know, way, you know, which yeah. got us to where we are now. Yeah, so let's talk a little bit about the patents because that's, um, Frank, that's how we met, right? Because I had written about your patent in, a, in, a, in an article in book, and I'm glad that... Um, uh, you, at least you read the book, so that was that was reassuring for me. Uh, but I'm glad we were, you were able, we were able to connect on this. But I'd written about, I think, this particular patent, which was your 2005 patent. Is that correct? Yes, correct. So you want to give us a little bit of background on that? And I think you have already given us in the in the uh, how it fit fit into your business plan. But how about in terms of your IP strategy? You want to go? Thank you. Well, this particular patent, uh, as we mentioned before, was. Um, an invention for a system, a, a mm-hmm. pattern system, and we created a method of uh, assembly and manufacture for a uh, unique uh, body type of the African, you know, uh, African descent. Um, it, it allowed us to look at the body type, but also look at what is needed to make products uh, for that body type from the oh. patterns and then from the dress form. And then right. how, how do you manufacture that? This, you know, the assembly, um, the shape and contours that were unique to that uh, uh, was very surprising, you know, uh, to a lot of manufacturers, which led us to where we are today. Uh, but that, that patent itself um, opened up a, a pathway of thinking for not only us, but for others, you know, as well about the uniqueness of, as you, you, you know, you discuss in your book about, racialized patents you know um there was a lot of pushback uh from the u.s patent office about this patent um because in their minds we were trying to patent the whole human race a, a certain race of people and yeah. it, it, it had body type yes yeah, so right yeah. but we're just talking about body type right it's a method of making for that particular body type and it was surprising yeah. to them and maybe you know they didn't understand because that's not something that they were taught in school about the design process for different design people, you know, yeah, we're yeah. designed differently. Now we can work on, you know, how that process works, what have you, but we know there is some type of biological design that is consistent, mm-hmm. you know, with certain, what we have created is racial groups, you know? So if you look at what we call different racial groups, there's some, some consistency there in you know, the shape, the line and the contour of those groups that can't be, you know, negated. And if that's the case, then if, why don't we include those differences into a model of, 
you know, design that allows them to participate in the cons consumer marketplace as well on equal terms. And so this is what that first patent was all about. And I think from a, um, I mean, there are a lot of really interesting just pure patent law and um, policy and legal issues that are, that are behind this. Let me uh, make sure I understand. I think it's probably worth exploring a little bit. When you're talking about a patterning system, um, you're talking about things like, I, as I, I think you sort of alluded to it, but let me put it at a level, since I'm not in the industry, um, you know, something like a dress dummy, right? You need, you need models like that that are used in the process of designing and making clothing that are just embedding a standard, right? We talked about the PS4270 standard. Yes, sir. So that standard that's been embedded doesn't incorporate difference or doesn't really allow for difference. It doesn't allow for difference because, because the input thought process um, yeah. didn't consider the difference. Right. And so what this system is is not only things like a dress dummy, that might be one example, but also the way in which the particular machine or other types of, uh, uh, of tools used for design and manufacturing come into play. Yes. Is that a fair characterization? Or Yes. So let's, uh, let me, I, I don't know whether this is devil's advocate or just looking at another position. This is something we raised earlier. Um, because it's the, the, from, the, from the patent law perspective, when you're talking about a particular body type, I, I guess there's a question about, you know, to use a legal term of art, uh, whether this is uh, too vague. Uh, because you want the, pat the patent language to be something that somebody can read and understand exactly what's being, um, what's being uh, you know, patented, you know, what's, what's the invention. So how would, you know, when, you, when you're trying to define this body type, um, I mean, obviously the patent was granted and, and you were able to overcome some of the objections. Did you rely upon, for example, anthropo anthropometric work? Or did you rely upon, because I know in our individual discussions, you talked about how you uh, have some very interesting background research talking to anthropologists and, and yeah. uh, other forensic scientists about body typing. Is that, is that right? Do you want to elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, you're correct. I mean, my wife and I, we did a lot of research and a lot of, had a lot of discussions with um, you know, doctors who have dealt with, yeah. uh, you know, cadavers and things of that nature. And one of the questions that we've always asked is, how would you be able to identify a person when you're just looking at the skeleton? How would you yeah. identify that person? How would you know if that person was female of African descent, uh, female of European descent? How would you know that? And there were certain bodies... Looking body at the skeletal form, not by looking at DNA, anything like that, right? Yeah, and not even the skin color or the, or the muscle propensity that, you know... Uh, the outward shape, but just the bone itself, because that's all you have. And yeah. so we're not looking at skin color. We're looking at frame. We're looking at bone length, density, uh, and, yeah. and things of that nature, angles of bones and curvature of spine, which, again, down to the skeletal level, there are some unique characteristics that are present in different groups of people, you know? Mm -hmm. And that's not, you know, trying to uh, put one group against another. It's just that we are human beings um, and just like the animal kingdom, we come in different sizes and shapes and forms, but there's consistent base level skeletal uh, and even muscle shape that is consistently uh, being shown to be prevalent within the you know large portion of different racial groups. Mm -hmm. and, no, and I think, I mean, the, and this is obviously fairly you know controversial in terms of the underlying anthropology and the history of this, but yeah. I think what you're pointing to is that some of this is used in forensic science. They have to identify bodies. They have to identify remains, whatever it might be. And so there is this notion of a type that exists there in, in that science, in that area, that has some relevance for what you're doing in fashion. I mean, it's, a, it's kind of a very macabre connection, I guess. But I, I mean, when we discussed about that, it was... Well, well if, you can identify, if, you can, if you can identify a person... Right? Yeah. In that particular science, then if that is a truth, which I mean, it's a legal truth because they have to identify the body. Right. How is it consistently being used as an identification legal, right. you know, uh, process? Why can't that be used in all processes of identification? Yeah, no, right, right. I mean, that's it's interesting. I mean, because I mean, I think you know, I haven't looked back at it, but uh, I, I would imagine the patent examiner's objection in part. Plus, what exactly does that mean? I mean, is, is there a clear legal meaning to body type that, uh, 
that makes this patent uh, yeah i mean we, we were pretty early with the with the with the uh naming of it when we started talking about body type but that's yeah. the only conclusion you can come to right i mean no, i understand i mean it's a, right i mean this is the art of patent drafting is you have to use uh language to get at what you're trying to talk about i guess you could have take, talked about standard body type or I mean, and, that, and that's something that I want to kind of move on to a next to kind of the next point. Uh, we have about maybe 10, 15 minutes left, and there's a lot to discuss. Uh, but l- let me let me accelerate this a little bit, uh, because one 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 uh, one comment on this that people might have would be, well, every individual has their own body type. So, wouldn't the the, the most important or the relevant business model be one where, and then subsequent IP strategy be one where? You create a, a some sort of a system where people could just scan their individual body type, whatever the you know, existing technology would be for that, and then they would send it to the designer and manufacturer to come up with uh, the, the clothing that would fit that. So it'd be really ultimate bespoke tailoring. Yeah. So is, is, do you think that's feasible? Is that where the future is headed, or what would be sort of limitations on that? Because then you well, wouldn't have to talk about things like race or body type. It's just every individual has well, a type. Well, the you thing is, type we have to yeah. identify the type, right? So whether we call that type, uh, yeah. you know, and we do have nomenclature for our different body types, you know? Yeah, yeah. And um, it's a, you know, a body type identifier. So it, for us, that size four woman is a size four. But when we mention the actual body types themselves, um, we have a nomenclature of N E R O. Mm-hmm. So that's how we identify that, each body. N E R O. What is that? Exact. Yes. Is that? That, that's that. That's the nomenclature that we utilize to be able to body type each uh, person. You mean that in the in the fashion industry, in the, in, in that in that industry, you right. use it? So, yeah. So when when you uh, have uh, a case where, like I mentioned before, a size four. Yeah. And yeah. you have four four different women, same size, same measurements, but different you know ethnicities and racial uh, categories. We we have to be able to identify it from a manufacturing standpoint. Okay, right. And I think that's the key. I I don't want to cut you off. I, mean, I think that's something that's important. Uh, why we talk about types or standards is that you know this ultimate model of bespoke you know clothing. Even that assumes some sort of standards. Uh, so yes. I know one of the things we talked about that you're using sort of 3D technology or thinking of moving in that direction and you know, you're developing databases and I want to talk about that uh, in a few minutes, but you know, all of that requires some sort of standard in order well, for it to be functional or yeah. operational. Well, well, anything you design, even if you yeah. scan the body, uh, yeah. you still get a unique standard that right. either is for the individual, but yeah. you're not going to take that same person that you scanned and use that 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 topographical information, you know, yeah. uh, meaning that, that pattern, yeah. those measurements, those contours, and those lines for other people, you're not. So everybody has to have their own pattern, is what you're, you know, you're saying. To right, and so that means, and, and, the, and the implication I'm getting at from that is that body typing is, and we can talk about it, but really that's not where the industry should be headed, especially if you're interested on this unmet need, right? Because then yeah. that ultimately meets the need for every single individual if you could do this. Yeah, but that'd be, in my opinion, um, to try to make it for every individual uniqueness, yeah. um, you yeah. have to have a base standard uh, in order to mass produce it. You know, because you're talking about time. We're agreeing on that point, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so you're, you're saying that, in, in one, there's, you're saying that um, if it isn't going to be feasible for people or for the industry to create um, individual body types by scanning, people yeah. and is that, is that going to be scalable um it you know it's sort of going backwards to like when people used to have to get their clothes made or people's mothers and grandmothers were making their clothes um yeah. it's sort of going backwards it'll be pretty hard to scale that uh-huh. yeah um, interesting yeah and then and then what is the price on that you know what are the price points for that for right. us, like you talk uh, about i think kind of i think those are all the relevant questions i, I think that's probably right I guess the only thing I guess a little bit pushback on is whether it is going backwards because the idea would be that, you know, as as the technology develops, a lot of this will be cheaper to do, right? I'm not saying we're there yet, but maybe you know whatever the point in the future would be. It's not like in every individual. I mean, it really is a question. The reason why the going back in time was so expensive was 
you know, all the human labor that's involved, and maybe some of the new technologies. And again, I, I, admittedly, a lot of this is science fiction, would allow an individual to scan their body, feed it into their 3D printer with whatever the material they want, mm -hmm. and voila, they have evening wear. You know, they have stuff to go out that, that night in. But, you know, that's obviously far away. But I think the point I also wanted to get across, and I think both of you have mentioned, is that there's always going to have to be some sort of standard. It is. Yes. It is. Yeah. It's going to have to be some standard. Even if it, you take all the human element about and automate it, there still has to be a standard, probably even more so. Right, because even tailors take a, they take a, um, you know, a basic suit and then then they tailor it and cinch it in or adjust the shoulders and yeah, do all yeah. those things. You have to have something. And it's easier if you have a base for the different body types yeah, to yeah, adjust, yeah. even for us to customize. Right. Yes. I mean, we, we can take that to a lot of, you know, a lot of different variations on this. And that is we've been talking about, you know, jeans or shirts. But I mean, ultimately, maybe all clothes, I mean, the, the whole idea that we're talking about clothing in this way, rather than just wrapping ourselves in cloth, right? <laughs> Everybody wears a sarong or something. That's always uh, a choice. It's a standard. I mean, right? I mean, so maybe maybe in the future, it'll be in a world where everybody can 3D print their own sarong. Uh, but I mean, the, there is going to be a standard even there that, that we're, that's implicit in what we talk about. And that's what's that's what I found interesting about this when I when I wrote the thing that I did that you, that you came across, and that's what I find really interesting about this business model. So, um, do you want to talk a little bit about this design patent that you received a few years ago? Well, the design patent um, is um, specific for a curved um, curved denim jeans for the different uh -huh. body types, and yeah. you can see the difference um, in the patent in the rise and front and the back for the different body types. Um, you can see some of the pronounced curves. Um, some curves are more pronounced than others in the different body types. Um, for us, um, and when we're talking to our clients and customers, we always want to emphasize that we're not biased for which is more beautiful than the other. We believe right. that we're all created equally beautiful. So just because one curve is not as full as an another curve, it does not you know, um, diminish uh, the value, the beauty of the individual or the person that fits in whatever ethnicity. It does not matter to us. We love, we love what we do, and it's very important to us um, that our clients understand and know um, that, you know, what we do embraces the curves where they are and, you know, uh -huh. in that individual. And so that's what this first, um, uh, this design pattern is about. It's about capturing those, those curves of the different body types um, mm -hmm. in the different ethnicities and making sure that everybody has an, a garment that fits them equally beautiful. Yep. Okay, yeah, so that's the idea behind the design patent. And remember, a design patent for, for, for listeners is you know, only covering uh, the ornamental aspect of this. There may be functional aspects to this as well, but they're not covered by this particular design patent. Pat and um, in some ways, it's what's interesting about the design patent, too, is in, I don't know, in some ways you move away from the notion of body type. I mean, the body type might be sort of ingrained or hardwired into the, um, you know, the particular ornamental design that's being represented here. But uh, this is kind of, again, something we could spend a lot more time talking about, but it's interesting to, um, uh, to just note it and maybe move on to some other things. So I think, Stacy, you mentioned that you received a patent last year. Uh, this is the application that I got this information from, mm -hmm. but this has been granted, is that right? Yes. Um, this one is for multiple body types and okay. multiple articles of manufacture. And so what that means is that we've taken and improved upon the first patent, and now we've, you know, based upon the all-inclusive design model that we have, um, we're able to really look at specific uh, body types and look at the industrial you know, products that we made, you know, for those particular body types, you know, so, right. you know, this allows us to create freely and uh, in a more open, you know, inviting way, you know, without any, you know, preconceived notions that there may be a group that we can't fit because we're thinking about everyone in our design process, whether, right. you know, petite, tall, you know, we have your athletes, uh, you have people with the now called plus size or right. things of nature. So, as long as you're human, that's who we're designed for. Yeah. 
And, I, and just to kind of read some of this, this is really interesting because this, this will lead us to where we can kind of end some of our discussion with, and that is um, a method for manufacturing a garment includes creating a database of various yes. body types. And so did you want to talk a little bit about that? I mean, we can uh, continue or segue into the last section of this, which is on commercialization. You're doing a lot of things. We mentioned the 3D printing work a little bit, but you're also yes. doing some things with social media. Is that right to create this database? Well, what, we, what we're looking to create is a solution that incorporates um, the, or envisions the whole hope of the fourth industrial revolution. Yeah. Uh, it's all about data, right? Data and technology and how do you yeah. use that in actual uh, designs, products. And so what we're doing is uh, working with a company, um, TC Squared, and mm -hmm. we're doing a 3D body scan um, pretty much re revisiting the methodology used by the Department of Commerce to create the PS4270. Mm -hmm. So we're creating our own in-house voluntary product standard. And we're collecting a very large database of, uh, of, of body types by using a 3D scanner, um, compiling that database to be utilized for what you alluded to earlier about uh, bespoke or custom fit. So we will have them on a database and we want to create a community with that because our our solution is, is, is an invitation and we want people to be more social as it relates to the industrial space. Um, and we need to have a conversation about the, our unique differences, but the product itself is a beautiful product. And we, I think we can all rally around the beauty of a product so we can start seeing and inviting the beauty and, re and receiving other people's beauty and uniqueness as well. And so we're really, you know, looking forward and excited about the 3D um, scanning process because, you know, for the first time we will have a database um, of people, but at the same time, our patents uh, allow us to move forward with creating a in solution for those particular unique um, body types that we've scanned as well. So you're basically using this database to create a new standard, uh, just to kind of summarize it. Yes. How are you creating the database? I mean, is it voluntary? I mean, obviously it has to be voluntary, but... Yeah, well, it's voluntary. Getting... <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. I know. Like, yeah we're, we're no Amazon, so we, we, we can't, we don't have perks of cash and things to, to you know, so right now, you know, that's, that's kind of where we are. Yeah, you know? so that's, that's how you're doing it, though. It's, it's like getting the models and getting the images yes. that way and then creating this database. So. And, 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 to, and to that point, I don't think we're going to have an issue because as you looked at in some of the data and some of the re literature that you have right. um, and, and what's available online, fit is a problem. So if there is a percentage of people with a fit problem, those are the ones that we're really going after. You know, we want to solve a problem for them and globally, but also it allows us uh, to, to educate you know, the consumer as well, the consumer marketplace, who may not have uh, the habit of returning the garments because right. they love what they have, because they feel like they have no other option, so they just have to make do with what they have. There's a large percentage of, of, of people, especially women, that do that. They don't return the garments because they just think, unfortunately, uh, because how uh, the industry and marketing has, has been over the decades, uh, they think something's wrong with their body type. And so this 3D scanning... Um, initiative that we're starting allows us to interact with those particular uh, people groups um, and allow them to know that we really have them in mind, you know, when we want to create this product. And so we want to build a relationship. Yeah, interesting. And then that will affect the way the product gets manufactured, designed, and then delivered, right? Exactly. We're, we're, we're a little bit over, but that's fine. We can go on for a little bit more. I just wanted to you know, I think there are a lot of really interesting commercialization issues that we've touched upon, you know, such as identifying the product or service, you know, explaining this idea of sort of a, either race-based or ethnic-based uh, body type versus a fully bespoke and you know, the problems with both of those or each of those kind of models in some ways and now developing a broader notion of, of body type to create a new standard to challenge the yeah. ones that are existing. And we had some good discussions about branding strategies and the market environment. And I, I use the word technological threats here because I was thinking about a world where everybody just has their own 3D printer and can make their own clothing. I mean, everybody does what you're trying to do. Uh, mm -hmm. And so that's interesting whether we'll get there. I mean, I think there's always going to be a technological divide that will create yes. the need for 
So I do want to wrap up a little bit, but I thought the best way to wrap up is to, to end with any final words about uh, what you've been working on, any final thoughts that you'd want to leave the, the, the audience with. Um, well, again, like you, <laughs> yes. Well, right now what we're working on is uh, expanding our IP um, in markets where we know that we've identified an actual um, fit need. You know, especially in countries that don't have their own industrial uh, standard as it relates to um, fit and uh, well, basically, you know, standardization system. Right. Uh, countries like India, China. Um, we, we're looking at um, Nigeria. You know, places in, in, in the continent of Africa, uh, Brazil, uh, as well. Um, a very interesting place. And so that's what we're looking at and identifying those uh, market areas where uh, we can have an entryway um, first with the IP uh, strategy that supports our business uh, uh, you know, motivation. And then from there, looking at how we can commercialize and, and be able to you know, manufacture and industrialize you know, uh, the product. And all of that entails a lot of work, a lot of research. Uh, we thankfully have people who are industry experts who are advising us and looking at this as a you know the future. Yeah, that's great. And of course, we're going to have continuing conversations about this. Yeah, well, David, do you have any uh, parting shots or parting? I thoughts? do. I do. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I thought you um, might. The <laughs> the idea of um, bespoke and sort of um, breaking. Um, people up into groups so that you can, they can have more specialized, their needs can be attended to. Um, this is not foreign in the medical industry. They're starting to, you know, customize medicine for people. Um, my husband and I do a eat right for your blood type. That's customized for, you know, your blood type. Um, and we see the benefits. This is just natural. And it's, you know, as you um, have compassion for, I guess, just the human race, you don't want to just do things for profit. I mean, you should not just want to do things for profit. And if we can just take time to look at each other as individuals and as humans, then we try to make the best um, product, the, do the best service, um, um, and be the best people so that um, what we offer is the best. Mm -hmm. And that's what we strive to do. And like you said, technology is um, is going to continue to customize things and figure out a way how to do it the best way. And as long as we keep in mind that we should not just be doing things for profit and that we take time to see one another and figure out what it is that's needed, um, profits come, you know, and people get better and things, things get better and, and, and technology advances. So um, I think that's what's very important for us. We never started this out just for money, and we certainly are not just doing it for money because it has not been um, profitable by the, in terms of what the industry would say because we decided not to, um, to uh, follow that path um, because this is something that we have to commit to because we see other people and we want other people to understand that they are seen and that they are important. Um, and so, yeah, that's what's important to me, that we need to make sure that we have um, our priorities right and understanding that people are important, everybody, no matter what ethnicity, no matter what race, um, no matter what group they are, that we are important and that as innovators, um, we need to understand that in order to be better innovators. Well, thank you. That's a great way to end. I want to thank both of you, uh, Valdavia and Stacy, for taking the time to speak with us out of, a, out of your busy schedule. I know this is, as far as the three of us, this is you know, part of an ongoing conversation. So I look forward to, uh, to talking with you again offline, and maybe in the future we can you know, celebrate your next milestone you know, online as well. So thank you again for taking the time. And uh, for, the, for the people who are, uh, are watching and listening, I'd uh, love to get your comments and questions. You can either contact me uh, at the uh, email address that's given here, or Stacy, you're also available for uh, any follow-up questions or inquiries. 
Uh, you can follow up at this email uh, here for Stacy, as, as well as you can take a look at uh, the website. So uh, thank you again for taking the time. I look forward to our continuing conversation. And uh, off screen, thanks to Joel for his patience and the, the technical matters. So, thanks, uh, Joel. Have a good day. Thanks, Joel. Thank you, Shuba. Thank you, Shuba.